Um, you, uh, I see this kind of flesh out in the way that I like to plan my calendar, and the way that I do my to-do list, and the way that we have fun at home. I need to plan it in advance, all these sorts of things. I like to know a plan. I like to know the direction that we're headed. And uh, as a church family, as church leadership, for the course of the past uh, year or so, it'll, coming up on a year in August, we've been going through a process um, of really looking at who we are as a church. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? What is God doing uniquely here in our community that our church family gets to be a part of as we are an expression of God's love and grace to the people around us here um, in, in, in the over the mountain area and in the greater Birmingham community? Um, so we have been asking some questions and landed in some areas, and Danny's walked us through this for the course of the past seven months or so, um, and we've, we've answered these big questions. The, the first one that we started with is what are we doing? As a church family, what are we doing? And we answered it with this mission statement that's boldly moving us forward. We are sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. We're sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. And how are we doing that? If we're gonna do that, if we're gonna have this bold mission of sending people out that have been transformed by the saving grace of Jesus Christ to have influence in the people that are directly around them in their neighborhood, on their street, in the, the workplace, in the office next to theirs, in the school, uh, after school group that you're a part of, all these sorts of things. If we're sending people that have been transformed by Jesus to influence the world for Jesus, how are we doing that? And uh, we, we do that by meeting together, by, by meeting with God together. And that's what we're doing here this morning. We're coming together, we're meeting with God, we're speaking and singing and listening to God's goodness to us in Jesus Christ. And we're meeting, connecting with each other. We're gonna spend time in these pews and before and after this service in small groups and around kitchen tables and dining room tables at lunch. We're gonna connect with others in a way that um, fosters in us further and deeper belief in Christ. And we're going to live with purpose. We're going to intentionally go out on mission, taking the good news, the love and good favor of Jesus with us. So what are we doing? We're, we're sending transformed people to influence the world for Christ. How are we doing it? We're meeting with God. We're connecting with others. We're living with purpose. But the bigger question, the one that we've been settling on in the, in the middle of this series, is why are we doing it? Why are we doing these things? Why are we doing what we're doing as a church family? And we do these things because of what we value, because of our core values. So um, this morning we're in, in week three of a five-week series, um, and we have five primary values here at Shades. And we value that every disciple is growing and every person is on mission. And Danny walked us through these two values the past two weeks. This morning we're gonna look specifically at the value of every relationship meaningful. Every relationship meaningful. And in the next two weeks, we will look at the value of every generation together and every pursuit with excellence. These values, they really shape who we are. They're a part of our DNA, of our culture. If you, you come here and you're a part of our church family, hopefully from one of the very first times that you stepped foot in the door and sat in a pew or, or stepped in the door and shook someone's hand, you've experienced this as a part of our culture. That's really what we're, we're talking about here, our culture here at Shades. We shouldn't have to sit down and kind of drill through and kind of poke around to see what we value. It kind of rises to the surface. The idea that we would value discipleship, people growing in maturity and intimacy in their relation with, relationship with Jesus Christ. That we value mission, it's a huge part of who we are. And that we value relationships. See, for each of us, our values rise to the surface individually. We work hard, we work diligently because we value the end product, whether that's providing for our family or uh, productivity um, or maybe we like generosity. Our, our values rise to the surface and it, and it funnels, it channels, channels what we do. It shapes how we, how we live. So we're going to answer this question, why we do what we do as a church family by assessing, by looking at our values. This morning, specifically looking at every relationship as meaningful. We wanna see this as a value that we have as a church family that's lived out in every aspect of who we are. We value relationships. We want our interactions with one another to be intentional, to be seasoned with hope and grace and purpose. That our interactions with one another would be from casual exchanges to intimate conversations but would be one that foster relationship and care and concern for one another. We value life together, purposeful, intentional. 
not a protected, glossy, self-promoting picture of our lives, but we value life in real time. When we talk about valuing relationship, we're not talking about getting it all together before you come to the table or before you're willing to have a conversation. We're talking about legitimately knowing one another for who we are, not hiding, not cowering back, but loving and caring for one another in the midst of real life. So this morning, we're gonna look at Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47, and this is really intended to just give us a solid framework for what meaningful relationships could look like for us as a church. So read along with me. This is Acts 2, 42, chapter two, starting in verse 42. And they, the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of, of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. So this section of Acts, it follows a major scene in the early history of the church. Early on in Acts chapter two, Peter proclaims the gospel in a really bold and compelling way. And there is a, a large group of people there that are hearing Peter talk about Jesus, the good news, the gospel, the good news that he came for us, that he lived in our place in perfection in an uninterrupted relationship with God his Father, that he lived in perfection, that he, he died on the cross taking on himself our offenses towards God, what our imperfection has given toward God. He died on the cross for our sins, and then he rose from the grave defeating sin, offering forgiveness and righteousness to those of us that place our trust exclusively in the person of Jesus Christ. So this is what Peter's talking about, and there's this large group, and after he finishes speaking, the people turn to Peter and they ask him, they say, this is really good news, so what do we do with this? And in Acts 2.38, Peter's response is um, to repent and be baptized. So what, what he's saying to them is to turn from your sin, turn towards your self-endeavors to pursue relationship with God or to, to pursue peace, turn from your sin and turn in belief toward Jesus. So they did. A group of about 3,000 or more of them, um, they did this. They turned from their sin and turned toward Jesus. And they, once they responded, they kind of got to work. And that's exactly what we see in this passage here this morning, starting in verse 42. It tells us what they did. And this is kind of like a summary narrative. It's a snapshot of the early church. There are several ways that we could look at this passage, and you likely have heard someone walk through this passage before. But for this morning, for our purposes together, we want to use it as framework for how relationships could look in the life of the church. I want to say on the front end that as we jump into this message that relationships are not easy. We are broken people that want to hide, and that's naturally where we turn. So when we come to the table talking about relationships being meaningful, we're all bringing some kind of a preconception or idea or even past experience of what relationships look like in our own life. We're bringing hurt, we're bringing disappointment. We are people that have hurt and who have disappointed. And so when we bring that to the table, it conjures up all sorts of kind of questions and insecurities and reluctancies that when we put out this value of every relationship meaningful, there's part of us that kind of cowers back a little bit. It says, I may be willing to be that for someone, but I'm not necessarily wanting to be that for someone else. What happens if they know me? What happens if I can't hide anymore? What happens if I do get hurt? All of these questions kind of come to the surface when we talk about relationship but we've experienced relationship through the whole progression of our lives, right? We have relationship with our families when we're initially born and come into the world. Our parents care for us and they watch over us. We enter into school age and we figure out what it's actually like to live around other people that are not inside of our family, what's socially acceptable and what's not socially acceptable, what behavior that will um, cause us to have friends will earn us and behavior that will kind of push people away from us. We learn all those things and we move to high school and there's this bit of independence that kind of props up within us and we don't just have friends because people, um, our parents are friends with people and their kids come over to our house or organize play dates, but we actually get to drive places and make friendships with people. Then you get to college, 
which is probably the most unrealistic incubator of relationships on planet Earth, where you are around people 24-7. You live in a dorm room with people. You have relationships just kind of ready-made in front of you. You're in organizations based on your choice and preferences and things that you like and are attracted to. You're in organizations that are just kind of custom and tailor fit to your personality, to who you are. And you live in this place where you have people that you like, that like you, that have interests like you have and, and are kind of moving in the same direction, whether it's major or extracurricular, anything like that. You go from that and you graduate and you move on to the rest of life, where you're around people all the time that are nothing like you. You may have a job in a, in a field where people may have a similar vocational interest as you have, but they're not, you're not just organizing wholeheartedly around kind of laser-focused objectives and ideas that people may have in common with you. So we move into this life and we wanna stay connected. We wanna, we wanna stay connected with those people that we've had deep, deep relationships with before. We wanna build intimate relationships with people that we will meet in the future, that we're meeting in the workplace. And in some ways, technology has kind of tricked us to think that it helps us in facilitating these relationships. And it, it can, technology can be an avenue by which meaningful relationship happens, but it, it is not a substitute for it. I want to read this quote from a sociologist, her name is Sherry Turkle. She says, it's when we see each other's faces and hear each other's voices that we see each other at our most human point. Technology can't substitute that for us. Living in a place that we just have community and relationships directly made around us, and then moving into the reality of the rest of life where we have to build and maintain meaningful relationships. Technology can't do that for us. It can help us in that endeavor, but it can't sustain it on its own. So this text, what we're looking at in Acts chapter two, it gives us a look at what relationships could look like among people who are following Jesus together. This is like a report from Acts in the first century, but it's also a challenge to us at Shades in the 21st century. Uh, this morning for our time together, we're gonna look at three we are statements, real briefly as we kind of work through this text. Three we are statements. The first one that we wanna look at is that as we are a church, we are people that are committed to meaningful relationships as we follow Jesus together. We're committed to our relationship with God and our relationships with others. We're committed to our relationship with God and our relationships with others. We see this in, um, in Acts 2, 42 and 43. Um, there's this whole list of things that the, the church is doing, and we see it kind of smattered in this section that we're looking at this morning, but two things that we see kind of specifically off the start is the church's intentionality in their relationship with God. It says that they were devoted, they were committed to, they were dedicated to the apostles' teaching. They were dedicated to the prayers. In verse 46, it talks about them attending temple together. We see that this relationship the relationship with God that they had and that we pursue as people that have placed our hope and our faith in Jesus, this relationship is foundational to all other relationships. A relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ, it's kind of ground zero for any other relationship that we would have or build. It's in our relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ that we have true acceptance, true love, true identity, we don't have to live in relationship to look for validation or for acceptance. Validation is given to us through Christ. Acceptance is seen for us in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And so we find our identity in how we relate to and connect with others in who God says we are, not in how people respond to us, not in trying to seek people's approval or trying to seek people's um, a, a companionship or affiliation with us, but we see God's intent and his desire for relationship with us through the cross, that God loves us to the point of sending his son Jesus to be a sacrifice for us so that our relationship would be reconciled, would be reconciled with God. We are restored, we're in relationship with our Father God. So we were created for relationship, this is what God has designed us for with himself and with others, and so it makes sense that after this group of 3,000 in Acts 2, after they've responded to faith in Christ, that relationship with God is reconciled, that they then get into deep relationship with one another. They devoted themselves to four things we see here. Teachings about Jesus, that's what the apostles talked about, time with one another, 
meals together. We see that this is really deep in our roots, that the church family eats together, enjoys time around the table with good food and good conversation, and praying together. They had one major thing in common, one major thing, and that was their commitment to Jesus. They would spend time listening to and learning from teachings about Jesus. They would, they would enjoy being around one another, not just out of obligation, but out of companionship, out of relationship and fellowship. They would eat together, they would pray together. So how did they do this? They're committed to relationship with God, and we see that through their devotion, and they're committed to their relationship with each other, and we see that through the way that they're spending time in fellowship, eating meals together, praying together. How did they do this? This is a group of 3,000 people is what the scriptures tell us. That's a lot of people to try and do that kind of thing, and they're not gonna go cafeteria style to a huge fellowship hall and sit down and have one large meal. They're gonna break it down in the context of relationship. They're gonna spend time in one another's homes is what the scripture tells us, knowing one another well. This challenge for this large church in Acts making it small in some ways is the same challenge that we have here at Shades. We have 5,000 plus members here that have been um, committed in membership to being a part of our church family. How do we go from this large room or that large number to meaningful relationship? We have to take the big and make it small. When we're together in a large room like this, there is great value to our time together. We're hearing the same truth. We're celebrating the same good news, just like Logan and Abby were talking about earlier. We need to hear and receive and respond to the gospel together as a family. But in these smaller relationships, and, and what we do just kind of as setting the table here at Shades in Sunday school and in discipleship groups, we're able to go from this large group to a smaller group where what we talk about and what we value in the large group is seen and we're held accountable for it in the context of a smaller group. Our relationships become less of just the people that are sitting next to us on the pew and more the people that are sitting right across the table from us or in the chair next to us. People that are committed to us. We see commitment here. As we look at the church in Acts and we hear this report, we also receive the challenge this morning that as we pursue meaningful relationships, that Jesus, our relationship with him would be our foundation and that we would be committed to one another, to time together and relationship with one another. The second we are statement that we have is uh, kind of centered around verses 44 and 46. We are committed to relationship with God and relationship with others. We are also generous and honest. We're generous and honest. We trust each other with transparency and time. And man, these things are two commodities that we do not give up, with, do not give up easily. The commodity of time is this thing that we spend and somehow never makes its way back around to us. We all get the same amount and we're gonna be very selective in how we give it and who we give it to. And most oftentimes, the way that we choose to give our time centers a lot around how we are served and the way that we give that time to others. The idea of transparency, that I'm gonna let you see who I really am and not just who I want you to see me as. That self-protection, that hiding, that self-preservation, that thing that keeps people at an arm's reach of relationship, that's something I don't wanna let go of. That's something that I don't wanna let down that guard or let people in. That's not what we see in this, this picture of this church here in Acts. This is, what we see here is the opposite of selfishness. We see that they shared their lives to one again, with one another, that they were together, that they had all things in common. We trust each other with transparency and time. We can't just look at for relationships for what they can do for us, how this person can help me or care for me or love me. God has given us relationship to be mutually beneficial, sharing life with one another. Some of us have significant investments that we can have in one another that are unstructured. It's not a Bible study or it's not a small group time. These things are really significant. They're really meaningful for us. 
Um, I think about uh, a group of guys that I spent time with um, during their college years. Um, I was investing in them, and they would come over on Sunday nights, and they would be in our home, and they would eat food out of our fridge, and they would drink one of my most valued possessions, my coffee, and um, we would spend time together. And before they, um, before our, our kids are all awake and hanging out around the house, and there are a couple times where these guys that are in our home, and please follow me here, these are like 20-year-old uh, guys that are in college. I've got a couple boys at the time, and they're, um, they're wanting to spend time with these guys that are older than them because they think that they're really cool. And these, these guys, these college students, they're going to sit down unstructured. This is not part of our group time together. We're not going through a book. And they're sitting down with our kids, and they're telling bedtime stories, and they're playing Legos. They're being real people to my kids. I'm getting to see them and who they are as they're following Jesus in the context of my four-year-old and my six-year-old. It's unstructured, it's unplanned, it's intimacy and relationship, it's committed time together. We want to be generous and we want to be honest. We want to care and we want to be transparent. I've got a couple just different ideas that we want to see within this idea of generosity, being generous and honesty. Um, we we see in the church in Acts, they shared their lives with one another. They had all things in common. We also see that they were selling what they had and that they were giving to those in need. So there's transparency in time. There's also this idea that we care for one another and we care for one another deeply. This is the opposite of entitlement. This friendship is this gift that God has given to us and it's a taste of his physical presence. That when we're actually around one another, we're caring for one another, we're knowing one another that God is there with us, he's caring for us, just exactly what Abby was talking about earlier before that song. Um, it's really awesome to be and kind of get to hear some of the stories that we hear in church leadership here, that there are families that are going through difficult times that experience loss, and in that, when that big is made smaller, and in that small group, when those needs are known, the way that that family, that small group, will rally around those needs and provide physical needs for those who've experienced Lost. There's a Sunday school class here at our church that um, we have a, a church member, she lost a business unexpectedly right about before it was, it was going to open. And that Sunday school class rallies around and connects some fun, collects some funds to try and provide physically for her and for her business. Now it's great because the, the church, that small group, is, is putting their resources together for the good of another. The giver gets to experience God's goodness as they do that, but also at the same time, Whenever that family received that money, they're receiving God's provision, God's care for them physically in front of them. That God knows their need, God is with them, and God is providing for them. This is the opposite of entitlement. Caring for one another is not caring so that we will be cared for, it's caring because we have been cared for by God and Jesus. So we trust each other with transparency and time. We care for one another. And the last is that we are honest with one another even when it's not easy. And we see in this passage in Acts uh, 2, 46, we see that um, they were distributing to one another as any had need. You know what that means? Is somebody actually said that they had a need, that they needed something. So we look at this often and we see this kind of like collection of resources giving to someone and we often think about the idea of selling what we have so that someone else can benefit from it. And that is actually part of what's happening here. People are giving of what they have, they're pooling all this stuff together, it's like they're having one massive garage sale and they're saying we're gonna take these funds and we're gonna divvy it up and we're gonna look at all the needs in front of us and we're gonna provide, we're gonna meet those needs through the funds that we collect. But the backstory on that is that somebody had to step up and say, I don't have it all together. I have need. I am in want. Now the idea here is physical provision. That's what we're talking about here in Acts. But the principle underneath it, the idea of willingness to confess need is huge. That plays completely in the face of what we would want to do and hide or protect or keeping others at an arm's reach, at an arm's distance. Saying, I have need. I have to be honest uh, with you this morning that this one is, um, is really difficult for me. It's difficult for me to sit across from the table from a friend and talk about the need that I have in my own life, whether it's hurt that I have because of disappointment, 
whether it's pain I have because of, of my own sin in my own life. It's difficult for me to sit across the table and say, I have need. And in the middle of meaningful relationship, not having the opportunity for someone to speak back to me the truth of God's goodness to me in Jesus. That's what I'm doing when I, when I feel like I don't have, when I have it all together and I don't have need and I'm not willing to confess it. I'm keeping from myself God's physical ministry of presence through my brother, through my sister who is sitting right next to me, who is sitting across the table from me. At the same time, I'm propping up this image that I am like Jesus, that I'm literally perfect and I don't, and that I have it all together and that I'm not in need or I'm not in want and I'm not like you. You may be in need, you may be in want, you may have things going on in your life that you need help with or that I can encourage you with or pray with you about, but not me. All that I'm doing in that moment is propagating the idea that, that people that are following Jesus, they're people that just have it all together and everything is perfect and the only reason we have relationship is just to kind of make each other feel good whenever what we see in scripture is that we have relationship because we literally need each other. We need God's presence among us through God's people. And when we are not willing to confess the need that we have, when I am not willing to confess the need that I have, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, the confession of sin in my own life, that I need the forgiveness of God through the person of Jesus. When I am not willing to do that, I am robbing myself of God's presence in my life and the ability for God to use himself in the person who's sitting across the table from me. When God calls us into relationship with himself, he calls us into relationship with one another, with this family, with these people that are sitting right next to you, that were in the Sunday school class before you walked in here, that will be in the Sunday school class when you walk out of here, and the discipleship group that you meet with on Thursday mornings, God has called you into relationship with each other, not of casualty, not out of hope that it'll work out, because you literally, we literally need each other. We need each other. God's presence, God's ministry to us is given to us through people that are in our lives, that are with us daily. We see lastly in this passage in verse 47, we see that they praised God, they had favor, I love this part. They had favor with all people. That, I, that word favor there is actually um, the same word as grace. It's like they kind of gave grace. They gave God's goodness and his grace to the people that were around them. They demonstrated God's goodness to the people that they came in contact with. Um, think of this idea that as we are dependent on, um, uh, on God and his provision for us in one another, that people would actually be able to look at us and see God's love for the world. This is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He gave his disciples their meeting. He gives his disciples, he says, this is a new commandment that I give to you, that you would love one another and that the world would know that you are my disciples, that you are following me because of the love that you have for one another. So think about it like this, that God has actually structured it in such a way that we are committed to relationship with him, we're committed to relationship with one another because we need one another. The church, we need one another as we're following Christ. We need one another for encouragement, for accountability, for support. We need God's presence among us through one another. But as we do that, that people would actually look at us and they would see God's care and be drawn into relationship with him. That's what the end of verse 47 says, is that because of what was happening, because of the grace and the favor and the way that the church looked, valuing every relationship as meaningful, that people were coming into the family of God day by day. People were coming into saving grace with Jesus Christ. People saw and experienced God's love practically and tangibly in front of them. Do we think about our relationships that way? Do we think about that as a church family, that as we value relationship, that we are being a witness to the world of God's love for people? When we love one another and we love those that are outside of our family, we are loving with the love of God. First John 4, um, 4 says that love is God. That when we are experiencing extending love in relationship, that we're literally experiencing, extending the experience of God himself. We're marked by God's grace. We extend grace to those who are around us. We have favor with those who are around us. 
So what does this mean for us? Okay, we look at this passage, we see kind of these characteristics. We're, we're, we're committed to relationship with God and with others. We're, we're generous and, and transparent. At the same time, we're marked by God's grace. What does this mean for us individually? This is who we wanna be as a family, but what about us sitting in the pew this morning? They have this story because they were following Jesus together. As we look at Acts 2, our goal is not to say, let's be an Acts 2 church. Our goal should be that as Shades Mountain Baptist Church, that we wanna follow Jesus together in such a way that all the relationships in our lives are meaningful and have significance because God has given them to us and he gives them meaning and he says that they have significance. The thing about a church is that it's made up of individual people. If you kind of just did a brief little survey of the New Testament and looked at the ways that Paul talks about the church, um, he uses all of these kind of interconnected imageries. He talks about um, a family and how within a family there are many members, so every one of us has a part in this family. The church is made up of people. Every one of us has a part in this family. A body has parts each different kind of ligament and organ and piece to who we are. The church is a body and we are all parts that make up that body. He also talks about a house, that a house has bricks and we're like bricks that are being stacked up on top, one on top of the other. And to this house that represents God's goodness to people. So as we talk about valuing relationship and this being who we are as a church family, we have to shake this down to who we are individually as people. We have to ask questions of our own relationships and how we individually view people on our own. So I've got a couple questions I want us to think of as we're kind of tying our time together this morning. The first, just kind of self-assessment diagnostic question that I would ask, that I am asking myself, is what kind of relationships am I building? As I look at those around me, those that are kind of casual interactions and those that are deeply invested in my life, ask the question, what kind of relationships am I building? And these pictures that we see from the church in Acts, they give good framework for us to ask questions of ourselves. Am I committed to my relationship with God? Am I committed to it? Am I committed to my relationship with others like I need them, like God has given them as a gift to me? Second, Am I generous and honest? Man, this is hard. Am I generous and honest with those who I am in relationship with? Am I giving and not just taking all the time? Am I willing to talk and to listen? Am I generous and honest? And then the last is, am I giving grace away to everyone? And the way that I live in relationship with people, if you were to sit in on the way that I interact casually with the people that I interact in the parking lot or the person that I'm sitting down across the table from, would you see grace, the grace of God reflected in the way that I interact with those in front of me? So what kind of relationships are we building? And then this, this second question, we're just gonna kind of land the plane here for today, is where do we need to repent in all of this? As we look at our relationships and how they are to reflect God's good relationship with us through Jesus, are there spots that we just need to stop and say, I'm not doing this right. I'm not loving the way that Christ has loved me. I'm not caring the way that Christ has cared for me. Because see, Jesus has done all of this for us. These things that we do and that we talk about in the context of relationship, he is this to us. He is committed to us. He is generous with us. He is honest in our need for him. He showers his grace down on us. This is who Jesus is for us. So it's not like we're operating out of some sort of kind of empty cavern where we're trying to well up this goodwill toward people and have meaningful relationships with people that we're around. We see all of these things in the person of Jesus Christ, that he loves us, that he gave himself for us, that he calls us into relationship with himself. And as he does so, he calls us into relationship with one another. We need each other. God, look at the person on your right. Just look over real quick. Look, you're not gonna say anything, just look at him. I wouldn't make you talk. Look at the person on your right. Look at the person on your left. Believe it or not, these, these people are God's gift to us as a family. These people, 
these relationships that he has put directly in front of us. They're his grace to us. They're his gift to us. Will we respond in that way? Will we allow ourselves to be generous? Will we allow ourselves to be transparent that God would shape us into the image of his son through our honesty? I was uh, sitting at a table with a friend um, probably six months ago, and he was telling me um, that he saw lacking transparency in my life. Not that I was hiding anything, but I wasn't willing to give anything. And he asked me, so why? What keeps you from being willing to give? And for me, honestly, at the time, there's this, there's this fear, there's this fear of hurt. So what if I say something or do something or you don't see that I have it all together and then it's somehow just flipped on me and used against me or you harm my family with whatever. And I, again, I don't have anything to hide, but there's still that fear that's deep inside me. He said, if you think that God's intent for your life is that you would just be easy, that it would just be easy and without pain, then you have got this whole thing wrong. God desires to use relationship regardless of where it goes, regardless of how it feels. He desires to use it for our good. That like 1 Corinthians said, that we would be able to rejoice with one another when there's time to rejoice and that we would hurt with one another when there's time to hurt. These people around you, these relationships in front of you, they're a gift to you, and they're a gift to the world. Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we talk about what we value as a church family, God, I pray that we would know that we are a part of this big this big group here, this big family that are all moving in the same direction, headed in the same place, to talk about the goodness that you have shown us in Jesus Christ, your son, and his life and death and resurrection for us. But at the same time, there are very practical applications of what we're talking about individually as we walk out these doors. God, I pray that we would ask questions of what kind of relationships we have in our life. What are we pursuing? What are our relationships oriented around? Are they oriented around ourselves? Are they oriented around the opportunity to be able to give the goodness of Jesus to people that are in front of us? Jesus, I thank you that you are not calling us just to be good people, to have good relationships, to do the right thing, but you are calling us to dependence on yourself as we have relationship with others. This morning together, we say that we are thankful that our relationship with you defines us, changes all of who we are, that you give us identity, you give us worth, you give us purpose. And we pray that as we build relationships that are meaningful around us, that we would base them all on that foundation of who you say we are and who we are in you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name, amen.